What do you do from here? I mean, when we last spoke, you talked about how uh, we're beginning to see a rotation into EMs, into value. Is that expected to continue? I believe so, yes. Um, you know, we are at a situation, and I, I think we discussed this last time, but the capital concentration risks for U.S. equities, and particularly in, in FANG and technology, uh, were a little bit concerning when you combine them with, with some of the high valuations. And I think now we're moving into that, that U.S. election cycle. You know, the first presidential debate will be next week. Uh, investors will be watching that. Uh, Biden is leading the polls at the moment, uh, and he is certainly seen to be uh, less accommodative of, of technology stocks. And I think the, the view of investors at the moment is, you know, you, you obviously need to have some of that in your portfolio, but with the, the decoupling of U.S. and China economies, uh, is it time to finally close underweights on Chinese equities and Chinese bonds? Uh, but if we want to still own technology growth, where, to, where do we go to? Um, and we've been talking a lot recently about the Hang Seng Tech Index to be, to be a, a potential area for, for money to flow into. And what about these F4 ETFs as well for China Tech too? I mean, is that of interest to you? Is it interested in a bifurcated technology world? Well, yeah, that's. I mean, that's. It is very much a demand-driven uh, uh, launch in terms of the, of the ETFs here in Hong Kong, which are getting exposure to Hang Seng Tech as, as the underlying index. Um, you know, as I mentioned, a, a big thing has been the need to close underweights to, to Chinese equities, uh, because as you can imagine, if you've been underweight Chinese equities over the last two years, your, your benchmark has been hurting a little bit. Uh, but still the need to, to have some exposure to tech, some exposure to growth. Um, and also, you know, having, having a listing in, on Hong Kong exchange gets rid of some of the, the, the risks or, or some of the, actual, of the ex, uh, extra uh, issues of, of moving money into China, hedging the, the CNY exposure back into local currency. So I think that's something that investors are looking at at the moment. I think it's, it's more of a long-term play at this point. You know, obviously tech globally is, is, is quite high in terms of valuations, but it, it has been very much demand-driven. And I think this is still very, very early stages. Thomas, so that, that brings me to what happens after TikTok. OK, that's not sorted out yet, but there's, uh, there's signs that perhaps the next company in the sites of Donald Trump could well be Tencent. And Tencent's got so many investments in the U.S., has got stakes in various companies, gaming companies in particular. Uh, does it not worry you that we could see this sort of balkanization of the Internet as a result of this, and that could actually pay, put pay to a more, let's say, forthright tech or Internet strategy? Yeah, well, tech is going to be one of the key battle, battlegrounds of the decoupling of U.S. and China. I think that's that's been made pretty obvious to, to everyone. You know, the latest is TikTok. Uh, you mentioned Tencent. Um, you know, Tencent's revenue from from U.S. is still relatively small. Uh, so I would actually be, if, you, if we're looking at, at, at U.S. tech versus China tech, I would actually be more concerned about companies like Apple, which derive a much higher revenue uh, to to Chinese consumers and to, to the Chinese economy. Um, but as I said, you know, this is something that, that is going to continue. Tech will be one of the key battlegrounds for, for U.S. and China as, as their economies continue to decouple over the next few years. Thomas, away from tech, one of the worst performing industry groups out there, the financials, do they represent a, a buying opportunity at the moment or is it like trying to catch a falling knife? It's, yeah, it's been a little bit like that for a while, but I think the difference now is with, with the Fed uh, quite clearly highlighting the need to get back towards 2% two, two inflation uh, and also keeping uh, short-term rates uh, uh, very low over the next few years, around zero, uh, and also trying to, to raise the back end in terms of long-term yields. If they are successful in steepening the yield curve, as they have been over the last few weeks, you know, clearly that is going to have a tailwind for financials, which, which will gain uh, on, the back of, on the back of yield curve steepening. So, you know, I, I do think at this current point, cyclicals are, are, are interesting uh, value, certainly um, on, from a longer term perspective, if you look at all the fiscal stimulus that's coming into the system and will continue to come into the system, places like infrastructure and material are certainly sectors that, I, that I'm looking at as well. Thomas, before we let you go, just a quick question on VIX. VIX has been pretty uh, resilient, 25, 26. If you're a long-term investor, what do you do? If you're a mom-and-pop investor, what do you do? What's your reading? 
Um, well, you know, if you're a mom and pop investor, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be really investing in in volatility. But there's certainly the need for uh, mom and pop investors, and not even just mom and pop investors, but also institutional investors, to have diversification, to hedging, to have hedging in your portfolio. How do you do that if you're not using sort of a vol vol type strategy? You know, obviously you can be in, in gold, you can be in the inflation protection uh, in the fixed income side, um, a, as well as moving into into some of the areas like infrastructure uh, and material, and also you know also energy in the commodity space.